All right. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, welcome to the webinar. My name is Tanmay, and I'm part of the developer community team. Today, we have James Craig, Senior Partner Solution Architect at Amazon. In today's session, he's going to cover um, how to easily create complex distributed cloud architectures for Temenos applications on AWS by setting up a hands-free application deployment pipeline without writing and debugging thousands of lines of configuration. So that's the session uh, for today. And um, there are a few things that you need to know before we start the session. Uh, we have a Q&A panel dedicated, so make sure you post your questions over there so, the, so that we have one dedicated space uh, with all your questions. And uh, we will answer those questions at the end of the event. Uh, so make sure you use the Q&A panel, not the chat window. Uh, we have a team um, you know, who is monitoring the Q&A panel, so post it over there. Also, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on Basecamp as a resource later. So in case uh, if you have your friends, colleagues, or you're not joined today, they can uh, get into it again on Basecamp. Um, so let me invite James and uh, uh, he's going to take it up and start the session. Over to you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Samay. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for coming to this talk um, about AWS, Temenos, uh, and Infrastructure as Code. Um, in this talk, uh, you can see from the agenda, we're going to cover the evolution of infrastructure provisioning. Aidan from Temenos is going to join me and talk about his experiences with Infrastructure as Code. And I'll introduce the AWS Cloud Development Kit, a new way to build cloud infrastructure, and show you a short demo. To introduce myself, my name is James Craig. I'm a partner solutions architect at AWS, which means that I work with AWS partners, specifically software houses, uh, producing financial services software, and I help them to adopt the AWS cloud. Uh, my background is that I have worked for uh, a long time in uh, banks and software houses myself uh, as a software developer, as a database administrator, as a team leader, uh, and the topic of automation of infrastructure is something that's very close to my heart. So let's talk about why automation. If you've ever provisioned IT infrastructure, uh, you know it's not as simple as just flicking a switch, plugging in a cable, or running a software installer. And compounded with requirements like having to provision infrastructure in different regions or creating a staging environment as a copy of production, it can become quite difficult. And this used to be a partly manual process with physical operations involving machine rooms, racks, cables, and power supplies, and teams of very specialist skills. But increasingly, it's now become a virtual operation where you provision networks, machines, and software in a virtual environment, be that on-premises or in the cloud. And the cloud massively widened the operations available to us, but also increased the breadth of services any one person is expected to understand, configure, and maintain. So it used to be that specialized data center operatives installed the hardware, networking team configured your network, sysadmins installed the operating system, DBAs configured the databases, then developers took over and installed them around the applications. But on the cloud, the dev, or as they become DevOps teams, are expected to do all of those things. And compounding this, modern cloud infrastructures, applications use hundreds of services and resources, like the Terminus Transact reference architecture on AWS you see here. And teams like useful tools to manage these. So infrastructure provisioning can be a full-time job, but it doesn't need to be. So how would you create cloud resources? Well, everyone starts off by creating resources in the console, but it's a lot of work to create significant infrastructure here because it's really hard to make sure you always take the same actions. Creating just one virtual machine requires you to make a lot of choices. This screenshot is just the first page of options from the AWS launch wizard, where you need to choose an instance type, an operating system, define key pairs, choose your disks, select a subnet, a security group to deploy in, and so on and so on. There's a lot of clicks and choices to make. So if you wanted to create another instance, would you want to do all that again? Are you sure you'll take all the same options each time? And how would you train someone else to do the same thing? So clicking and manually provisioning cloud resources is hard. So there must be a better way, right? And of course there is, and it's come to be called infrastructure as code. So this is a concept that's evolved over time. It started with manual deployments where we used documentation like wikis and playbooks, which are created with the best intentions, but turn out to be really hard to maintain. We've all been there when you're following the instructions and it turns out the process has changed since the last time the document was updated or something got missed out of the document. What do you do? You find the guy that did it last time and you ask him questions and hopefully he's still there to ask them. 
The next step is scripting. You do everything in Bash or Perl or Python, whatever your favorite language is, which works out pretty well to start off with, but inevitably it gets more and more complex. And it turned out that writing libraries in Bash wasn't a great idea. Or maybe you inherited scripts in a language that wasn't your favorite. The end advice ends up being, if it works last time, don't touch it. The next step is the introduction of infrastructure provisioning engines like Ansible, AWS CloudFormation, or Terraform. These tools attempt to hide the complexity of state management, rollbacks, drift detection, and error management, allowing developers to describe their infrastructure in a declarative way as a template and hand over the execution to the engine. Many companies and developer communities adopted this new infrastructure as code concept and adoptions increased rapidly. But this leads to growing sizes of templates which are hard to maintain in JSON or YAML formats. What's missing from these tools is the lack of programming language. So the next idea is to use generators. We write code that generates the JSON and YAML templates from the glasses and methods of a programming language. And evolving from that idea, new tools emerged, such as AWS CDK or Pulumi, which provides tools and frameworks to create custom abstractions for cloud infrastructure. So let's look at that in more detail. What do we mean when we say infrastructure is code? It's the process of defining, provisioning, and updating IT infrastructure through code. Rather than clicking buttons to make actions happen, you describe a desired environment, and the code becomes the documentation. You let the cloud infrastructure do its job, allowing you to safely and predictably deploy and change infrastructure. Codifying your infrastructure allows you to treat your infrastructure as just code. You can author it with any code editor, check it into a version control system, review the files of team members before deploying, and you can go back and see the full history of your infrastructure alongside its application. On top of this, automated tooling means that you can build CI CD pipelines for your infrastructure, containing tests and the facility to automatically roll back unintended or breaking changes, ensuring your architecture deploys as expected. So let's talk about scripting. Scripting is infrastructure as code, but it's pretty hard, as anyone that's worked directly with AWS CLI will know. You'll be doing a lot of reading the documentation, spending time with trial and error, working out the exact commands you need to run. And then you have to handle the API behaviors like authentication, error handling, and rate limiting. And once you start building complex architectures, you'll have to model dependencies, like a database needs a subnet to live in, a subnet needs to be in a VPC, and so on. At the end of the day, you end up writing a lot of code that's largely plumbing. It's not for your application, and it's not very reusable or easy to maintain. So what about template-based tools like CloudFormation? Essentially, CloudFormation is a wrapper on AWS API. All AWS services start off with an API, and when you interact with them via the console, say to create an EC2 instance, the web console in the end is triggering API calls to the underlying services. So CloudFormation works in the same way. It calls the API, and you'll see that CloudFormation parameter names match those available in the API. So you write a template in JSON or YAML, and you present that template to CloudFormation, which translates it into a set of API requests, executing them in parallel wherever possible, managing the dependencies and relationships between the resources. CloudFormation has inbuilt validation and version control, and that combination is one of the biggest draws from a customer perspective. The service can roll back to the last good state on failures. So this is a small example of a CloudFormation template using a number of functions. This is part of creating a CloudFront distribution. So this is fine. It gets the job done, particularly if you like YAML. But here's the problem. It's not that easy to read. It's very hard to debug. And there's no abstraction, which makes it hard to reuse and extend. Modeling infrastructure is essentially a repetitive task. But with YAML or JSON, the way CloudFormation uses it, you can't use the full expressive power of programming languages to model infrastructure. So what's the next step? The logical next step is the infrastructure is code, and you can make that leap using the AWS Cloud Development Kit, or CDK. So what is CDK? It's a software development framework for defining AWS Cloud infrastructure using familiar programming languages. We released it in 2019, open source on GitHub, and it's been hugely successful both within AWS and with our customers. So why use CDK and not CloudFormation templates? Well, you get easier cloud onboarding, there's fewer new things to learn are using tools and skills you already have. So the development process is faster. With the expressive power of programming languages, you can use objects, loops, and conditions. There's no context switching because you build your cloud application and its infrastructure without leaving your IDE or programming language. And it simplifies the process of building your own components, which we call constructs, to reuse and share whilst enforcing organizational requirements. And it comes with built-in constructs implementing high-level concepts with best practices, like a whole VPC out of the box. 
so that frees up teams to own their own infrastructure and reduce reliance on shared infrastructure teams. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Aidan from Terminos, who's going to tell you about his experiences with infrastructure as code. Yep. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, so let's have a quick look at how we've leveraged the AWS CDK in Terminos. So just a quick introduction about who I am. Um, so I'm Aidan Pasquale. I've worked in Temenos since 2018. I initially joined the Jumpstart team where I was working on the on-premise stacks um, and sort of authoring run books and that kind of work. Um, that sort of progressed over time into the stack automation initiative um, where we used Ansible to automate the end-to-end -end deployment of our on-prem stacks. Um, from there, I progressed into the cloud, um, primarily AWS. So I designed the AWS Transact Reference Architecture with James. Um, I did the testing of that, created the run book for it, um, hosted a few training session, sessions on that. Um, and then following that, we worked, me and James, we worked on the automation of the AWS Reference Architecture. Um, and doing that, we, we leveraged the CDK. Um, and nowadays I'm working in the Cloud Technology Solutions team. So before I transitioned to cloud, we had our traditional on-prem stacks, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So that's stack one through six. Um, so originally the only option really for a Temenos employee or even a customer was to get the associated run book and then deploy everything by hand pretty much. Um, after a while, we sort of realized that this process had issues. I mean, I'm sure everyone's familiar with following run books. You do everything as the run book says, it takes quite a lot of time in and of itself. Um, but the, the real issue is there's a lot of chances to get things wrong. And obviously once, even if one mistake is made, it could potentially delay the whole, the whole project of setting up the environment. Um, especially in customer, you know, situations, that's quite, quite a problem. So the way we sort of, uh, answered that issue, as I mentioned, was Ansible. So we kind of, we wanted to sort of move away from the traditional run book um, process and do anything by hand and we wanted to give both colleagues customers um, alike we wanted to give them scripts where they could just run a script and before they know it they've got the stack deployed end to end and they can get on with their work and not waste any time you know, deploying and configuring so yeah so from there we went on to the cloud uh, the cloud stacks, um, and this this same issue, you know, was present. We we had run books, but again, they they had the same flaws. They became even longer. They become even more complex, um, especially when the readers probably aren't familiar with the cloud platform. You know, it's there's quite a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. Um, so that's when we looked at a way of automating our cloud stacks. Um, we initially thought about using Ansible again, like we did for on-prem stacks and even other tools such as Terraform. But we ultimately just decided that the best approach was probably to go with the cloud vendors, you know, recommended solutions. So for AWS, of course, they have CloudFormation. That's their in-house service for doing precisely that. Um, and after I started using that and testing with it, we realized that it's actually quite difficult to do, you know, to create something as complex as the transact architecture with just raw YAML. Um, so as James just showed that CloudFormation, uh, sorry, the cloud front uh, example, it's pretty, it's pretty complicated and, and it, you can do it definitely, but when you're doing something on a scale with the amount of resources that we have, it's quite difficult. So that's when we were introduced to the CDK, um, which allowed us to use our preferred programming language. So of course, that's for, that, for us, that's Java. Um, to create these scripts using code rather than doing it by hand in YAML. So if we just have a quick look at the Transact AWS architecture, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this at this point, but it's obviously quite complicated. So there's around 15 services in total being used. Um, and obviously with each service, there's lots of, there's resources, there's lots of configuration. So ultimately there's a lot of chances for mistakes to be made. Um, and that's what, of course, ends up you know, costing a lot of time and effort. 
So as I said, the, the issues with these run books, they become a, very long. So the AWS run book that I produced was around 100 pages, thousands of lines and you know steps to follow. And that could take hours or even multiple days to complete. Um, so customers initially used this run book when, we, when they first started you know, using our AWS stack. But once we actually gave them the CDK code um, further on down the line, this vastly increased the rate at which they could get their environments deployed and the testing, you know, started and just the whole project was definitely helped, helped speed up by, by using the CDK code. So this is just a brief snippet of some of the code for the Transact CDK project. Um, so in total, it's of just over a thousand lines of Java, which of course is, you know, it's a fair bit of code, but that actually produces over 4,000 lines of YAML. So you can, you can see obviously that there's a huge difference there um, in terms of effort and the time taken. Um, and that's over a hundred AWS resources as well that that is created. So those numbers alone, I think, give you, give you an idea of how the CDK sort of simplifies this whole workflow. But the one thing it doesn't really quite show is just the difference in complexity. So when you're doing this with a CDK, as James mentioned, you can leverage the power of a programming language, whereas in raw YAML, you haven't, you just haven't really got those features. So that's the real, you know, that's the real value of using a CDK for us. It just vastly um, simplified this whole process. So it's been a really useful tool. Um, so if you're in, any of you are interested in using this internally, we have this package available as a zip file. Um, and it comes with a simple readme file, which just shows you how to consume it basically and how to deploy it um, rather than following a massive run book. There's no, there's no need for that in this case. Um, so with that, I'll hand back over to James and let him explain the CDK in some more detail. Brilliant. Thank you, Aidan. Um, yeah, I think it, it, and it's it's been a lot easier to uh, maintain as well. Like when Temlus adds new features, we can put them in the CDK quite easily. So let me tell you a bit more about what CDK really is. It's a build time tool that generates the static YAML artifact that gets deployed in CloudFormation. So it's not that we don't really like YAML, but YAML pre-processing is a client size job, not a server side job. So you need a local tool to do the advanced work. The CDK is an elegant tool for accomplishing that. CDK supports multiple programming languages. Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, and C Sharp. So with C Sharp, with CDK, it'll be faster than with previous tools because you work with a language you're already familiar with. You don't have to context switch. You have all the tool support from your programming language that you already set up, like autocomplete, inline documentation, tests, linting, and debugging. So you use the same tools and mental model as you do for your application development. To facilitate so many languages, AWS CDK is actually developed in one language, TypeScript, and then bindings and libraries are generated from the other languages through the use of a library called JSII, which means that CDK libraries are automatically generated in multiple languages on the release of a new TypeScript version. So CDK applications can be written in different languages, and it's slightly different between them because all languages have their own way of doing things, but the high level concepts are the same, and it doesn't matter which language you use, the output is CloudFormation scripts. CDK provides sensible default values for the AWS API parameters where possible, which reduces the amount of documentation you need to read to get up and running. And all of these default values can still be adjusted for your needs. And crucially, you're then able to build your own abstractions and components of the infrastructure application, something that isn't easy to do with CloudFormation alone. These are the three main components of CDK, the core framework, the AWS construct library, and the command line interface. With the core framework, you can create and structure apps that contain one or multiple stacks. Stacks are logical units of infrastructure which contain multiple resources and are mapped one-to-one -to, -one to CloudFormation stacks. So it's good practice to divide your resources into stacks that have different life cycles. So you might create one stack for your network infrastructure, another stack for your container infrastructure, and another stack would be the application that runs in the container cluster. Then that AWS construct library is a set of components created by AWS to create resources for specific AWS services. This helps decouple libraries and then you use only the dependencies that you need for your project. It's built with best practices and security considerations in mind to provide good developer experience, ease of use and fast iteration cycles. And then finally, the CDK CLI helps you to interact with the core framework, for example, to initialize project structure, inspect differences between deployments and deploy easily to AWS. 
At high level, CDK consists of two parts, the CLI, which runs on Node.js, and a set of language-specific libraries referenced by your CDK project. Your CDK app is a code generator, not a general purpose application. So when you hit run in the IDE, you generate CloudFormation templates. You don't actually build infrastructure at that point. So the CDK imperative logic is executed to create an immutable declarative CloudFormation template, defining the desired final state of your AWS resources with different application inputs, potentially producing different templates, which means you can put all of your configuration into the code base itself, rather than using external environment variables or CloudFormation parameters. Then you can use the CDK CLI to deploy the template bundled with any dependencies it has to AWS using the CloudFormation service, which itself is unaware that CDK is being used. And if necessary, you can also take the templates and use it directly in CloudFormation, bypassing the CDK CLI. So the best way to show just how easy, simple, powerful CDK is, is with a demo, which I have uh, recorded in advance to try and avoid any problems. So uh, here we go. Okay, so here's the demo of uh, using CDK. So I've got my favorite uh, IDE uh, Visual Studio code open here. Uh, I've created a new folder. I've got NPM installed uh, and away we go. So I've also uh, set my AWS credentials up uh, already so that I can do uh, use the AWS CLI. Let's just check that's working. Okay, all good. So first step, let's install the CDK using NPM. Just in case I already have it installed, I'm gonna ask for the latest version. And I'm gonna update it globally, force an update. And let's check that that's worked. See what version I've got now. CDK is still moving pretty fast, so it's a good idea to check you've got the latest versions every so often. So I've got 1.76. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use CDK init to build the framework for my application. So I'm going to tell CDK I want to initialize a new app. I want to do it in Python. I'm going to use Python for the demo because there's no compilation stage. It's nice and simple to use. Makes things move a bit faster. Okay, so you can see CDK has created a number of files for me and it's printed out some information, which is what you'll find in the readme file. So it's created a cdk.json file, which tells CDK to execute the application. It's also created a Python virtual environment for me to use so I can install my dependencies locally. In fact, it's still doing that now. I just need to activate the virtual event. Okay, so I'm in my Python virtual environment. Next step is to install the basic requirements for CDK and Python. So we're going to pull down some libraries that I need to get started. That's the CDK core and its dependencies. Okay, so now I'm ready to go. So we'll see that CDK has created some files for me already. So here is the file it's created. Uh, this is just an outline of a stack. It doesn't actually have any resources in it. But at this point, I can run CDK synth to create the CloudFormation version of that. OK, that's visual, visual code realizing that I'm using uh, Python. Let's get rid of that. So CDK synth is going to execute my application and generate a CloudFormation template as the output. So here it is. Uh, you can see there's quite a bit there already, just as the, uh, when it's boilerplate, just checking that uh, CDK is installed properly as the right versions. 
So now we can actually start building some code. So next I'm going to install some construct libraries for specific AWS functions. So we're going to install EC2, ECS and ECS patterns. So EC2 and ECS are low level construct libraries for creating resources. ECS patterns is a higher level construct library, uh, allows us to glue these things together in a very simple way. So while the package is updated, I'm going to update my uh, imports in the file first so that I can use those new libraries. So I'm still importing core from CDK, but I'm also importing uh, the new libraries, EC2, ECS and ECS patterns. And then I'm going to start building infrastructure. So first I want a VPC. So I'll create a VPC from the EC2 library. I need to give it a name. This is just a name that will appear in the CloudFormation stack. I'm also going to restrict the number of AZs because I wouldn't want more than three. The default is to create a um, subnet in every AZ in the regions, which could be more than three in some of the large regions. So that's it. That single line of code is created with VPC. Next, I want to create an ECS cluster. Again, I need to tell it what stack it's part of. I need to give it a name. These names need to be unique throughout your stack. And I need to tell it what VPC it's going to use. So that's the VPC I just created. And there we go. That's an ECS cluster, one line of code. Next, uh, I want to create an ECS service. So now we're going to move to the higher level construct library, ECS patterns. ECS patterns has got some uh, great methods we can make use of uh, that do a lot of the hard work for us. So we're going to go for an application load balanced Fargate service, which does pretty much what the name suggests. So again, it's part of the same stack. I'm going to give it a name. Now all of these CDK constructs uh, set sensible defaults for pretty much everything you want to set, but they also have the flexibility to allow you to override pretty much everything. So we certainly need to tell it what cluster we're using fundamental. Um, we can override the amount of CPU that's allocated. The default's 256. So let's give it a little bit more. Let's uh, tell it how many uh, copies we want of the image running. So the default is one, but we can easily raise that up to two, make sure it's highly available. Let's raise the memory limit as well. Default's 512. So let's give it a bit more. Not that much. Uh, by default, this is going to be a private service, but we want to make it public. So let's give it a public load balancer. Let's override that to true. It's default to false. And then most importantly, let's tell it where it's going to get the task from. So that's task image options. And ECS patterns will help us out again here because it's got a shortcut. So the image, we're going to use a uh, predefined container image. We're going to use one of the ones provided by Amazon for demos. Okay. And with that, <clears throat> So another 10 lines of code, we've defined a public uh, 
internet facing load balanced Fargate service. And we're all done. We can save it. Let's do CDK synth again. See what the output looks like this time. See whether it works. I've got a typo. Of course, not enough brackets. One more bracket should do the trick. Fingers crossed this is going to work. Okay, we got cloud formation. Uh, hopefully, you can see as that scrolls past, there's a lot more in there now than there was before. As you can see, there's uh, <clears throat> IAM policies, all sorts of things. So, you know, our 24 lines of code has generated uh, significantly more cloud formation. And in fact, if you look in the CDK.out, you can see the uh, output uh, in here. So in fact, that is uh, a thousand lines of cloud formation. So with the cloud formation's ready. I've got my STS credentials. We can actually deploy that. So all I need to do at this point is CDK deploy. It's going to build the application, generate the cloud formation, and then it's going to ask me to review the changes if there are any sensitive uh, changes in there to do with security. I'm going to get a summary of those and be asked to confirm that I want to change them. So here we go. It's telling me that I'm making some changes to IAM required for my Fargate task. I'm making some changes to security group to open them up to the load balancer and the internet. So I need to confirm that I want to do that. So I hit yes, and it's going to start making the changes. So let's have a look at what's going on in my AWS console. So here's my AWS console. Here's the CloudFormation stack being created. It's in progress. You can see that it's building away. And you can see that the 25 lines of code that I wrote has created a lot of resources. There's an ECS cluster, there's a Fargate server, there's a listener on the load balancer, there's security groups, there's task definitions, there's IAM roles, there's VPCs, there's subnets, there's root tables, NAT gateways. There's a whole lot of stuff there that was abstracted for me by CDK, which is a much easier way of working. When the stack finishes, it's going to give me the outputs that I want to know, which in this case is going to be the URL of the Fargate service that's been created. Okay, while the stack is deploying, I just wanted to show you one of CDK's many killer features. I think it makes it really worthwhile working with. Uh, you know, as people may be familiar, with uh, typically when you're building infrastructure, you have many components in different security groups and subnets that need to talk to each other. And quite often you'll find that you've missed a rule in your security group. You need to open up access, say, for your service to talk to a database. And it's gonna be quite a complicated task to do in the console. You need to find the security groups that are involved. You need to work out what the rules are to go between them. It can take a bit of time to do. When you do this in CDK, it's much, much simpler. So let me show you how. So we've created the service here, so let me just assign this to a variable so I can make changes to it. And then creating a connection to, let's say, a database that I might have created elsewhere in the stack is as simple as doing this. So I get the service. Uh, it has a service underlying it, which is the Fargate service that's been created. This has an object 
which represents the connections that are allowed to and from. And this has a handy method on it called allow allow to default port. So then I just apply that on my database object. Um, CDK is going to infer what the default port is on my database engine, and that set up the security groups that are required to allow the two resources to communicate with each other. It's as simple as that. Okay, so the CloudFormation stack is built, it's complete, and there are some outputs in the stack, so it's printed them on the screen for me. So what I'm interested in here is the URL for my service. So if I click on this, it should show me, it's asking me to confirm the open. So here we go, and there's my container in ECS, a successful demo. Now, just as importantly, you can destroy everything that you've just built by doing CDK destroy. So don't forget to clear up your resources if you're just testing. Yes, I am sure I want to destroy it. And there we go. That's the CloudFormation stack being deleted again. And we can see that in the console, the stack's being shut down again. And that was the demo. This is quite a strange experience watching yourself do a demo. Uh, so to sum up uh, what you just saw there, we start our project by executing CDK in it that will generate a project structure for our specific programming language. And then we can start creating an app, our app. We can add stacks, constructs, and resources. Once we're done, we may have to build a project depending on the language we've used. Like if we use TypeScript, we use the command npm run build. Or in Java, you'd use Maven package. Then we need to synthesize our code to a CloudFormation template. So we run CDK synth to do this. This will generate CloudFormation templates and assets, and we call this bundle a cloud assembly. Before we deploy, we can inspect what we change if we deploy this cloud assembly using CDK diff, which shows us which resources will be deleted, updated, or created by comparing the local template with what may have already been created in the cloud. Then with CDK deploy, we push the changes to AWS CloudFormation, and from there, the service will create cloud resources in our AWS account. And then CDK destroy can be used to tear down all of the infrastructure that we've created. So now I'm going to dive into some CDK concepts in a bit more detail. Stacks are the unit of deployment in AWS CDK. And when you run the CDK synth command for an app with multiple stacks, the cloud assembly includes a separate template for each stack instance. Even if the two stacks are instances of the same class, the AWS CDK emits them as two individual templates. So your development and test environments can share the same class, but create different infrastructure by providing different parameters to the classes. But you can synthesize the templates individually by stack specifying the stack name in the CDK commands. Constructs represent infrastructure, and CDK includes the AWS construct library, which constrains constructs representing all of the individual resources and services available on AWS. For example, S3.bucket class represents an Amazon S3 bucket, and DynamoDB.table represents an Amazon DynamoDB table. So this library is a starting point to create resources, and the big advantage is to have compositions of these services that represent complex infrastructure, such as network, setup, clusters, and databases. So let's take a look at the various levels of constructs and when to use them. With CDK, you have a lot of choice about what level you want to work at, and CDK has constructs on multiple levels. At level one, we have constructs that are automatically generated from the CloudFormation resource specification called CFN resources. These are one-to-one -one mappings between classes and AWS resources. At level two, we have higher level service constructs to represent resources such as a VPC, which includes another other resources like subnets and security groups. And here we add sensible defaults and handle glue logic for you with some boilerplate code. At level three, we have opinionated abstractions that are created by AWS that connect multiple level two constructs together in common arrangements. For example, the ECS service that we saw provides a full stack for a web application. And they can also be third party constructs from the community or your own libraries representing your own reusable abstractions. So each layer is built on top of and cools down to the previous layer when executed. So as you go up the stack, the number of lines of code you need to write decreases, but you're still generating basic underlying cloud formation. 
Level one constructs of the lowest level have direct access to generated CloudFormation elements. This provides the ultimate control, but also requires knowledge about the properties of the resource specification. CDK tries its best to make all the fields optional, so we try and generate properties where we can, such as names or well-defined defaults. Moving up to level two, constructs can generate more complex structure containing multiple resources, but there's still scope to specific services like RDS or the VPC. So anyone who's built a VPC from scratch in CloudFormation can relate to how challenging that setup can be and how long it takes. But here we have a ready to use VPC, which is one line of code. So by default, that's a VPC that spans all the available AZs, it has public and private subnets and spreads 65,000 IP addresses across them. It comes with an internet gateway, root tables, everything you need for a fully configured VPC, but you still have the flexibility to change and override any option you want and adjust it to your requirements. CDK also provides abstractions to provide safe and secure permissions. So I showed you one in the demo with connections between security groups and here's an IAM permissions based example. Typically we want to give a resource in AWS access to another resource, for example, read, write and delete. And with CDK it's just a one liner calling grant read or grant write on a target resource. So in this example, we have a Lambda function that takes a file from S3 and writes to a DynamoDB table. With CloudFormation, we would need to create a policy with two separate statements, one for read permissions to S3, and one for write to DynamoDB. And following best practices, we should also scope that policy to specific resources. So read only for the specific bucket and write only for the specific table. So in CDK, we just define a table object, an S3 bucket and a Lambda function. And then we just call grant read and grant write data on them to provide permissions for the Lambda function. And CDK generates the correct policies for us. So this helps us not only much faster and secure, but it also simplifies the thought process of going from what you want to the code. Now, level three constructs are compositions of resources across different services. In this example, we saw in the demo, the application load balanced Fargate service creates an application load balancer with corresponding security groups, listener configuration and target groups. It also creates a Fargate service with its own IAM roles and policies, log groups and task definitions, just by providing two parameters, an ECS cluster and the name of the Docker image, which shows you how powerful level three constructs can be. And you can create your own abstractions that others can share either publicly or privately within your organization. For example, AWS solutions constructs of vetted architecture patterns available as an open source extension of CDK. They can be easily assembled to create a production ready workload. And you can filter this library of best practice architectures to find the right solution for your use case as you build out your application. No matter what level of abstraction you want to work at, you can use AWS CDK to help you generate infrastructure as code. So if you're a super experienced infrastructure engineer who wants the most control, you don't see anything in CDK that fits your needs, then you can go to the lowest level abstractions and still benefit from CDK as a framework to create higher level abstractions, which can then be reused, shared with others, allowing them to benefit from your work. But if you just want to build infrastructure for your applications quickly, then you can use the highest level abstractions out of the box as pre-built building blocks that reduce your work, allow you to focus on developing an application. And there are new extensions CDK principles evolving all the time. For example, CDK Pipelines is a high level construct library that makes it easy to set up a continuous deployment pipeline for your CDK applications powered by AWS Code Pipeline. Once you've set up the pipeline the first time, you don't even need to CDK deploy anymore. The code check-ins themselves trigger the pipeline and deploy the infrastructure. And you're even able to make changes to the pipeline itself through that code, such as adding new deployment stages or requirements to get the deployment. CDK is a library that applies the same design concepts as CDK, programmatically constructing and applying YAML configuration files to Kubernetes, working with any standalone cluster, but also integrated with CDK if you're running EKS clusters. And there's also one for Terraform fans. CDK for Terraform allows provisioning with the Terraform engine rather than CloudFormation. The adapter works with any existing Terraform provider and with the modules hosted in the Terraform registry, allowing AWS CDK constructs to build infrastructure in multiple clouds. So you're using Terraform as an engine, not as a language. So I recommend that you give CDK a try. There's plenty of resources out there to get started with CDK, such as cdkworkshop.com, which is an online training course that walks you through using CDK at your own pace. And there's also a wealth of documentation examples provided by AWS. AWS CDK is an open ecosystem where we have a public roadmap to show you what features are prioritized by customer feedback. And you'll find that at the AWS CDK GitHub site. And we're happy to have many contributions to the community. In fact, over 50% come from the community. And we'd love to have your voice in future development. And there are also many other resources you can find in places like CDK Patterns or AWS Solutions Constructions. So you can check out how others are using CDK to build their services. 
So to sum up the benefits that I've talked about, using CDK means you can apply the same model for both your application and infrastructure. So no more context switching between the two. Use the same language, tooling, and workflows for both aspects, which simplifies your work, allows you to take full advantage of modern programming environments. You can apply programming paradigms to infrastructure modeling, including control flow logic, object-oriented techniques, and organize your projects into modules. Once you've defined your application as a high-level abstraction, you can share the libraries with the built-in controls and defaults to ensure best practices. And infrastructure as a whole, as code as a whole, means accelerated delivery by reduction of manual steps and more time to add business value. It brings improved reusability and simplifies maintenance by integrating testing and QA and having less code to read. So you can go faster while staying safe. So thank you for listening. Uh, I think we have some time now to have a look at the questions. Sure, how to see the questions. So, let me see if I can answer some of the questions, maybe AWS specific ones. Um, Henry Kumar has asked whether CDK works only with Transact. So, not at all. CDK works with uh, any application that wants to build AWS infrastructure. Um, using, you know, it's been very useful with Temenos, but anyone can use CDK to build their infrastructure. So I think there's a couple of questions there about how exactly you use CDK. Uh, I think I mentioned at the end there, uh, there's a online workshop. And so it's called CDK Workshop. You can just go to cdkworkshop.com. Uh, it's free online training with a workshop that will give you step-by-step -step guidance of uh, how to build applications with CDK. So that is my recommendation. Um, Aidan, there's a couple of questions there about how people could, um, you know, get access to the CDK script uh, and give it a try. Do you, do you have any advice there on how people can do that? Yes. Um, so I will, I think if I can get a list to send, send out a link for it. So we'll, I'll hope. Um, so there's a central sort of location for everyone to go to download it. Um, I'll get that sent out after the call. Okay, so perfect. Okay. Yeah, I guess if people... yeah, what we can do is we can post the links that you provide on the um, webinar page. Yep. So including yep, we'll the CDK workshop. So anything that you give us, we'll post on that page for today. So yeah, so for George, the answer is yes, we've got that package and we'll, yeah, we'll distribute it after this call. Um, for George's other question, however, the microservices, that's a good question. Um, at the moment, the CDK um, template doesn't include that, but we definitely can work on that um, as that's definitely quite an important piece nowadays. Um, so that, yeah, that will come, that will come soon. Brilliant. I think that's it then. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Um, back to Tamley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James and um, Aiden for this session. It was indeed a good session and um, I thank you for your time today. Um, and I wanna thank the entire audience today. Uh, I hope you found it valuable. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, we are still available. The Q&A is still open. You can post your questions over there. And, um, and we, we will also uh, post the Q&A transcript, um, which will be um, on Basecamp, it'll be available there. So keep a check and you will see all the question and answers over there as well. So if you wanna read it again, uh, or if you don't have the answer today, uh, make sure you go to the article and um, you will see all the uh, you know, answers to all the questions that you see today in the Q&A panel uh, while the experts are still answering. So um, uh, before you all go, um, I wanna wish in advance Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. Um, I hope uh, we see you again um, in the next webinars and um, you know, see you again next year. Uh, thanks so much for your time today, uh, once again, and um, I hope to see you in the next webinar. Uh, we are still online right now. I'm going to put myself on mute, but the Q&A is still open. Uh, feel free to post your questions, and 
you know, we make sure that you get you get the answer. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, once again, James and Aidan, for the session today. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. Bye bye.